Despite the Soviet Union's gradual demise in the 1980s, the prospect of nuclear war in Western Europe was perhaps as real in that decade as it has been throughout the Cold War. The Warsaw Pact's significant quantitative advantages in tank terms prompted a serious rethinking in NATO about how to improve the survivability and fightability of their own tanks. Hey guys, welcome to our channel Alpha Tanks, where we tell you about military tanks, from the most famous World War II battle tanks to the most advanced MBTs at present. So stay with us till the end of this video so you don't miss out on any of this information. But before we proceed, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click on the bell icon so that you don't miss out on any of our amazing videos in the future and let's get started. That redevelopment has been aided significantly by the British development of a new type of armor known as Chobham. This new generation of tanks had left some designs in the cold, one of which was the Vickers Valiant, also known as the Vickers MK4. The Valiant was severely damaged in a transportation accident after failing to receive orders. The design's emphasis has been on acceleration and torque rather than top speed, so its biggest problem was considered to be its relatively low mobility. With the design failing and the need for a new successful product, Vickers was pushed at the extreme limit of the Valiant project to integrate its own universal turret design with the latest high mobility hull and was taken to account its own options for a Valiant 2. When the hull of the Valiant was destroyed in an accident, Vickers and its partners needed a new option. The solution to both the new hull and the mobility problem was found in the West German Leopard 2 hull, and mating the Vickers universal turret to that hull produced a very capable vehicle known as the Vickers MK7 II. After the British shared Chobham technology with the Federal Republic of Germany, it had come full circle to now have a German tank with the British Army, and now a British turret to try and meet an export market in the Middle East. The Leopard 2's hull armor was identical, with Chobham-type armor across the frontal arc on top of a rolled homogeneous steel-armored base. The Valiant had saved a lot of weight by going with an all-welded all-aluminum alloy armor hull. The weight had increased with the larger Leopard 2 hull in steel, but so had the engine power to move the vehicle. The turret had a steel-based structure as well, and while the exact makeup was never revealed, it should be noted that the Valiant, or MK4 as it was originally called, was based on MK3 technology. To improve ballistic protection, the MK3 switched from an all-welded steel turret to a partially cast one. Despite this change, it appears that Vickers returned to an all-welded steel structure in order to accommodate the blocky sections of Chobham. The Challenger 1 had a complex steel half-casting covering part of the roof, sides, and all of the front, to which rolled homogeneous armor was welded to complete the structure, followed by the Chobham packs to complete the external appearance. Chobham armor covered the entire front of the turret as well as the sides until about a third of the way back, when it became hollow boxes for storage around the rear corners. West Air Dynamics' large and effective nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare air filtration system was located in the center of the turret at the back. The unit was mounted externally and was easy to replace and maintain. It had a multi-stage high-efficiency filtration process and worked to create an overpressure inside the tank, which served not only to keep gases out of the tank, but also to evacuate fumes from the weapons. The Gravener Firewire CO2-based could be switched for other gases such as Halon Automatic Firefighting System was fitted to the Valiant, and an automatic firefighting system from the Leopard was simply used on this MK7. The enormous selling point of the Universal Turret was not only the coupling that allowed it to be mated to a wide variety of the most common tank hulls in the world's armies at the time, but also the variety of guns available. The Valiant began with the dependable Royal Ordnance L7A3 105mm rifled gun, but it was quickly replaced by the L11A5 120mm rifled gun. When it came to the MK7-2 tank, there was no 105mm gun option because no potential buyer would have wanted one, as the 120mm gun was now the standard for NATO tanks. If the buyer did not want the powerful L11A5, they could opt for the Rheinmetall 120mm smoothbore, which was approved for the German Leopard 2 and the American M1A1 Abrams. The MK7-2 was a true world beater with probably the most reliable hull in the world at the time, the Leopard 2. And this turret featuring some of the most advanced fire control of any vehicle, the addition of the best tank gun available in NATO, and armor to match any contemporary. Exports of this tank would technically and potentially imply that the UK was selling tanks that were on par with, if not better than, its own and those of its allies. The ammunition storage capacity for the 120mm Rhine Metal Smoothbore ammunition was 44 rounds, 
20 in the hull front, 15 in the turret bustle, and 9 in the ready rack in the turret. The storage capacity of the British 120mm L11A5 rifle was listed as 38 rounds. The reason for the low amount of stowage is unknown, as the smaller Vickers Valiant turret could store 52 rounds and the turret was unchanged in terms of stowage. 15 in the turret plus another 20 in the hull rack next to the driver equals 35, which means only 3 rounds in the ready rack instead of 9. The elevation range of both guns was identical, ranging from minus 10 to plus 20 degrees. The rate of fire was given as 10 rounds per minute when loaded manually, one every 6 seconds. The barrel was clad in a thermal sleeve to reduce distortion, and a Vickers muzzle reference system on the end of the barrel added additional information to the computer system. Marconi developed an all-electric system for the fire control and gun stabilization systems. This system included a built-in laser rangefinder and a brand new ballistic computer to increase the likelihood of a first-round hit against static and moving targets, as well as to support firing on the move. The Marconi Radar System Centaur 1 system used the FSCS 600 computer, which was derived from the GCE 620 system installed on the Vickers MK3. The Royal Ordnance Nottingham ROL 11A5 120mm gun was 7.3 meters long and weighed 1,782 kilograms. It improved on previous designs by employing a forged upstand for the muzzle reference system, as well as a smaller volume and lighter fume extractor than the L11A2. As a result of these modifications, the gun was out of balance, requiring 7.7 kg of additional weights to counterbalance it normally. A single 7.62mm Hughes chain machine gun was mounted coaxially in the main gun, and a second 7.62mm machine gun, L37A2, was mounted on the roof in a remote control mount next to the commander's cupola. A total of 3,000 rounds could be carried for these. Both of these weapons were interchangeable, with a variety of 12.7mm machine guns that were commercially available. In 1985, firing trials with the British L11A5 rifled gun were held in Egypt. 43 rounds of armor-piercing discarding Sabbat ammunition were fired at targets 2.6 meters high between 1,100 and 2,600 meters, resulting in 32 hits, 74.4% accuracy. A second set of 40 shells were fired between 1,100 and 3,000 meters at the 2.6-meter high stationary target, achieving 33 rounds on target, 82.5% accuracy. When the firing trials were repeated against a mix of stationary and moving targets, a total of 65 APDS rounds were fired at ranges ranging from 1,100 meters to 2,370 meters using both gunner and commander stations to control the firing. In total, 37 rounds were accurate, 56.9%. Using high explosive squash head ammunition, a rate of fire of 6 rounds in 43 seconds was possible, 8.4 rounds per minute. The Egyptian team had the MK-72 driven up an 18-degree ramp, brought to maximum elevation 20 degrees, and fired in one of the most unusual firing trials ever asked of a tank. The goal was to stress an APDS shell to test the strength of the coupling between the hull and the turret. The British team was very concerned about this test, not because of the coupling, but because they had no idea how far an APDS round would go fired in this manner, even if the backdrop was the vast Egyptian desert. Regardless, the round was fired, the coupling survived, and no random camel herd appears to have discovered the true range of the maximum elevation 120mm APDS shell. And that's it for today, guys. We sincerely hope you enjoyed the video. If so, please click on the like button and share it with your friends and family. If you have any questions or comments, please share them with us in the comment space below. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to see even more of our incredible videos. You can also check out our other videos that have been specially selected for you. We'll catch up in the next video.